it's a it's record, right? <laughs> Are you comparing DPW to a psychiatrist? No, no, it's like get smart. Remember, they would lower the cone of silence. You had to have sight. You had to protect. Didn't work very well. All right. Next for your approval, the minutes of the October 24th board meeting. I make a motion that we approve the minutes of the October 24th board meeting. Everyone satisfied with it? Yes. No one second a page, a point. Uh, on the second page, fourth line down, I wonder if it should be uh, private ways are black and white. Does, does oh, not feel. Um, Mike already corrected okay. that. Uh, Thank you. Mm -hmm. He's on the job. All right. Yes, he emailed me today. <laughs> so all in favor of approving the amended minutes? Aye. Aye. Great. Uh, we have a request for a waiver of fees or a prorated fee for a sandwich board. Um, sandwich board fees go by the calendar year, so only six weeks left. Do you want me to explain? Yes. Sure. Why don't you, you, you have the conversation for that. Um, this woman came in because she's opening a new business downtown, and she wanted to have a sandwich board for, <coughs> um, it'll probably actually only be four weeks until the new year and I said we don't prorate the boards and mm -hmm. I talked to Ned about waiving the fee if for this four weeks so she could have it out for the holiday season if she paid for her Next. annual permit for Next January year. because we didn't the staff didn't want to get into prorating fees but she's a new business owner so I didn't Ned and I talked about it. I don't have a Problem prorating fees, but I don't think we should do it on a weekly basis. I think maybe a quarterly. half a year or a quarterly basis would be more appropriate. And if you take it out for the year, but you close your business, do we give a rebate back? We also, don't. we don't. Right. So I can see, understand, you know, that maybe we have to ask her to pay a quarterly fee for the last quarter of this year, and next year she pays a full fee. But prorating weekly, I can see that then also then coming to tables and chairs, prorating tables and chairs. I just remembered that we had acknowledged and agreed to prorate another sidewalk sign earlier this year for a couple that was knowing that they were going to go out of business. And so I just know that we had already set the precedent. But the idea of, pro of having them pay the annual fee at this point, I think it's a great idea. Uh, so I mean, if she pays her fee for next year. Yes, yeah. exactly. And I think that's, put it I think a, that's a good compromise. Early just to... Yeah. Give it a start. I mean, it's and can okay. the office start taking money for next year? No problem. No problem at all. Okay. Is everyone comfortable with that arrangement? Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of just an FYI thing, so I yeah. don't think we need a motion on this, or do we? It's a waive of your policy, is what it is. <coughs> can I make a motion that we waive the fees uh, for the, this business whose name I've forgotten? Yeah. <laughs> gift store. Well, it doesn't say. Huh? A new gift store. <laughs> gift. Provided they, they pay and pull their, their fees for uh, calendar year 2013. Second. All in favor of that? Aye. 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 Next request for permission to occupy Pulaski Park on Saturday, December 1st, between 4.30 and 6 for the Recreational Department and bids annual holiday tree lighting ceremony. As in the past, they've requested a waiver of all fees. And the mayor has approved the waiver. Oh, because didn't he reject? Uh, this is a city event. It's a, sponsored by a city entity. Okay. The academy is owned by the city. I'm glad. <laughs> okay, good. Move approval. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Request for permission to occupy Pulaski Park on Monday, December 6th through the 19th uh, to place a menorah in the park. There'll be one public lighting. Um, well, then I could do it day by day. One, only one lighting, apparently, on t Tuesday the 11th between the hours of 6 and 8. And they're still waiting for police concurrence. That's correct. I move we accept, um, assuming the pol police. It's the same one we have every year. Yeah. Second. 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 Okay. So a motion is uh, to um, grant permission to occupy Pulaski Park, pending police concurrence. All in favor? 
sir. Aye. Aye. Contract for wastewater treatment facility electrical testing. Uh, electrical testing protocol and assessment. So are, are they working on developing a new protocol for testing and assessment? Do you want to say... Finish our motion? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I'm just trying to read it. Uh, contract for waste treatment facility electrical testing protocol and assessment. The client fell down now. They're $8,400. Move approved. Second. So, as you recall, uh, we actually had a memorandum done, a technical memorandum done with um, RDS, I think it was. RDK. 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 Yes. And basically coming up with an idea of what it would cost to uh, replace the existing generator and the switch gears that are there that are related to it. One of the things that hasn't been resolved is what provided that ground fault at the existing generator. And if we did do all this work, but it's still ground fault, we're going to have to start off. So what we're trying to do is simulate a power outage at the plant to make the power go on the backup generator to see if it is ground faulting out and where that ground fault is so that we can fix that problem permanently going forward before we have another large investment or another failure at the plant in the future. That's what this is. This is our coordination of it. We would need to hire a separate contract for the, the electricians to come in, the backup powers, but they're coordinating the whole event because I personally have never done a, a shutdown of a facility like this. Um, so we ask for their expertise in that. They just went through one with the city of Pittsfield where they did a simulated power down. They started, I think, at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, low flow hours, and they, they were successful in it. But it took them, I think, three plus hours to go through the, all the phases of power down and plant start up again. I think part of this uh, protocol as well is going gonna, is gonna to give us information relative to how well the electrical system is functioning at the plant because of the problems that we've been having. Um, the last memo that we have from Kleinfelder included a very large capital cost for replacement of the generator and switch gear and a lot of other equipment out there. And part of this work, I think, they described to us was going to help us better understand the priority of that work. In other words, do we need to get a new generator and switch gear and electrical systems out to the plant next week? Or do what we have on site, is that going to be enough for a year or two years so that we can work in um, the design and construction of a new generator as part of the overall wastewater treatment plant upgrade, because we, Ned and I are a little bit concerned about moving ahead with a big generator project, sort of ahead of our implementation of a phased sequencing plan for upgrades at the plant. Right. So, you know, this is going to be one important piece of a puzzle to figure out what we have. Can we continue to, is it serviceable for six weeks, six months, a couple of years, and, do, you know, does that buy us enough time? To look at backup power as part of the treatment plan, all the upgrades out there. So I, I guess my the reason I stumbled reading this, I was kind of like thinking about, are we going to get a, a, a binder? Uh, are we asking them to develop a protocol that we could, the staff could on a six month sort of timeline go through the book and shut things down and learn from this? Or are they going to, is Kleinfelder to come out and oversee this on a one-shot basis? This, this is a one-shot basis. There's no binder? There's no, there's no... There's not a protocol that goes going forward. This is basically a major testing event of our capacities that we have down there. And we're trying to find out what is wrong, if anything. So it's not something that you would use on an annual basis, say... We're, we're not required to by permit, and I don't think we'd want to do this on an annual basis unless we were required to. It's a fairly, I think, big undertaking with the backup power sources that might be needed to be there if something does fail during plant startup again. And we have to ensure that that plant is going to be operational after we shut it down. And for some reason, systems fail, we need a backup power system there to run the facility. So the question of the emergency generators that we need and what equipment they'd be hooked right. up to. and So it's, it's a determination of some complicated electrical backup systems that need to be in place in order to implement the protocol that they come up with. So it's a, you know, like Ned's saying, it's a very... It's a so you bring in a rental generator? Yeah. yeah. Chris? 
Um, would this be something that you might otherwise have to do as part of moving forward with the upgrades of the, the facility itself? We wouldn't do it if we were going to put a new generator in. If we, we knew we were just going to replace all the equipment, I don't right. think we'd bother okay. spending the money. Right. I think one of the things we're trying to figure out is when do we need to spend the money? Um, and can we, does the 30 year old equipment we have, can we get another year out of it? Or, you know, what, what's the time frame? Or are we going to continue to have problems under an emergency condition? Sort of in a risk, risk assessment tool in a way, right, to figure out what a what are some of these unknowns about your power system? So, so one of the instances that happened with the flooding of the plant was that we had a ground fault. We believe the generator fired up, and it sensed a ground fault, so it wouldn't power up. And then after so many minutes, it cycled itself off and shut itself off. We didn't get any alarms that the generator is on or anything was wrong down at the plant, so we don't know. All we know is that it did ground fault out for some reason. Was it because of all the water backed up in the pump gallery? getting electrical components down there, or is it there's a major short in the system that we don't know where it is? And that's the other part of this, is trying to figure that out why, why that faulted. Gary? Yeah, I read the, I read the report, and, it, and, and I can understand why you would stumble on this, but when I, when I read it, my understanding was they were designing what they're gonna, what the $8,400 is for, is to design the test and to make sure that everything's in place so that uh, you really understand. You can isolate things and, and you know which component is working properly and where and which one isn't if it isn't working properly. And then to have the resources in case something does fail, then what do you do? So you, you're shutting the plant down, but you can't do it for a, a long period of time. You have to start it back up. So I, I think that was, that was the way I read it, is that they're designing a, a testing protocol. But it's not something we could reuse in the future. You could reuse it. I mean, I'm hoping we won't have to reuse exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> but, 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 but say the results yeah, of the test. This is a, this is a, 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 this is just a, like a once in a decade kind of test. You wouldn't do this. Yeah, I mean, it was weekly or monthly or yeah, even annual annually. basis. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not an electrical engineer, but I, I, I imagine you could have a scenario where the test results are so borderline they may not be comfortable with the condition of the equipment and they may say, you know, geez, just to be safe from a risk management perspective, you may want to do this every year or every two years. But I think the intent is sort of one time do it and hopefully the health of the equipment is such that we'll get some time left of, of the equipment we have and we can roll that upgrade in um, over time and be safe. Chris, did you have your hand up or were you? No, thank you. So, I'll let go, but I, I'm just digging a little. I, the reason I'm digging is thinking, all right, if this is a protocol, I'm looking for the binder. I'm looking for this to be on the shelf. It comes out once a year to run this test, or is it biannual? Or it is. And this is a one-time test. The document could be used for future ones if we decide to undertake it, or DEP requires it as a part of a permit every five years. We have to do it once every five years or once every year. I don't think we want to undertake it once a year because the I think the cost of it is going to be. But how much are we spending? We don't know yet to repair the losses from the problem the other day. Uh, about one hundred twenty thousand at this so time. So if we ran this test every two or three years, it would have. I mean, it's possible. I'm just. That's all. I'm just asking why. You know. All right. We've stumbled across a flaw. In fact, we have a, we want to test it, check it out, think about it. I mean, once we have that figured out, I, my thought is you want to run the test every now and then. We could do it on a scheduled basis going forward. But this one right now is scheduled for one time event, but the protocols that they're established so could be used again. So the, the expense in this contract is to establish the protocol. That's what we're paying for. We're not paying for the test, we're paying for the... Uh, what is the test? And they'll oversee the first test, I assume. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, how much extra would the test cost? Go ahead. How much extra would the test cost? We don't cost know that yet. We don't know until we know what the test is. So once the protocol is established, then we'll figure out we what... we put out a contract for that. Mm -hmm. And will this be after we have the new installed $120,000 of equipment installed? $120,000 that was spent is not... 
That was to repair the existing equipment that got damaged. Is it is that now installed? Oh yeah, oh. it's all in place. I didn't know how yep. everything time was involved. No, everything's operational to plant again. Right. So so they're testing what's actually going to be continuing in operation. Right. That's correct. I wish Mike was here. I mean, I just I bet he read the report too. I saw him yesterday. He didn't Probably provide me any comments that any concerns he had with it. I'm not concerned about the, I mean, I'm, again, tell me to shut up if you think I'm, I'm just drifting off course here, but I'm not concerned about the spending the money to have the protocol developed. I, it strikes me, though, that this may be an opportunity to take this protocol, make sure it's robust enough that we can then put it on the shelf and take it down every two years or when, on some kind of schedule that henceforward we're proactively testing this stuff. It will. I, does that make sense? Is what it I'm does thinking. make sense, but what we don't know is what the upgrades of the plant are going to be and are those protocols going to change in four or five years as we undertake the comprehensive plan of upgrades that they want us to do down there. And that's, that's an unknown. So the testing protocol will be a written document. Well, it will have to be detailed enough so that we can bid it to electrical contractors in order to implement the protocol. So we'll have a scope of work and a requirement for emergency generators and connection points and turning power off and turning this on and measuring this ohms and this watts and whatever and coming up with data that they're going to take and then and, uh, interpret and provide us with a report about what the meanings of the results of the protocol are. But the protocol itself will be written probably in the form of a scope of work that we can then bid to get a look at the contractors to do it. So I think in terms of having something on the shelf we can use today, we can use tomorrow, we'll be able to continue to use it until we do such significant changes at the plant, like Ned suggesting that the protocol won't apply any longer because we've got different size engines or different points of power or different, different right. power requirements and things. So, yeah, so I think in the interim, for the plant that we have today, we'll have a protocol that will be used and will continue to be able to be used until the plant's upgraded. And will they give us some advice as to whether they think this is a reasonable thing to, a reasonable test to run? And how, if so, how often? We or is this so once in a blue moon that they think it's reasonable to run? Right. And that's why they're recommending that we do it. And they've indicated that they've done it at other plants recently with, with good success and, and good quality data that's helped you know, other towns with um, you know, decision making about power requirements. So um, that's what I'm anticipating out of it. For purposes of discussion, maybe you could ask them whether they think it would, would be reasonable to run this on an annual or on some, any kind of a scheduled basis? Sure, we can talk to them. Sorry, you're further. Oh, but, but there's going to be some, I mean, the cost of, of there's the cost of developing the protocol and running the first test, it sounds like there's going to be other costs that we incur every time we choose to run this right. protocol. That means bringing in backup generation and, and it sounds pretty. Like it could be an expensive endeavor. It could be costly. We'll be back in front of the board with another oh, contract. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll know. I don't think our city. Yeah, I'm not sure we run, run it off the section. Yeah. But you know, it seems like it's never been done, and the thing's 40 years old. Maybe every 10 years. Uh, I mean, I don't. The engineer hopefully could be a little more, uh, give some guidance. But it doesn't seem un unreasonable that we would run a, a full-scale test occasionally. I mean, the, gen the backup generator gets run on a somewhat regular basis just to make sure it's functioning and it's going to transfer. We've never done a full plant shutdown of, you know, pulling the plug, per se. You'd rather when do when it. We were commissioning Cogen, um, it, was, it, was, it was all new switchgear, and it was double-ended. So there was a, 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 a bus fly that went through the whole lineup, and there were various major breakers that go on to four different transformers on our campus. And um, you should be able to feed in power from both ends. And they were running a routine test. Nobody expected there to be a problem. This is brand new switchgear. And we ran the test there like three times and we shut the whole campus down three times and then people were going crazy. Did you do it during finals? What? <laughs> No, but it was during school year, I mean, you know, middle of the day, and bam, the lights go out, and everything shuts off, and 
a while, and so nobody expected it. We had to, we had spent a lot of money bringing in Southern New England testing, Southern New England electrical testing, and they hooked up wires to this thing. It was like it was like they jerry rigged the whole room where all this brand new gear was. There were wires all over the place, little boxes, and they said we're gonna we're gonna do it again. And so we knew what was gonna happen, and we had to do that twice. And they recorded ohms, watts, amps, stuff I never heard of. And they they showed this thing, and what it turned out to be, we had a brand new breaker that was bad, it had this like little fracture in the ceramic coating, and it was made by Siemens. Oh. It was a total of five full campus trips, and there was no other way to do it. No so, did, are you speaking in favor of some kind of uh, organized testing on a regular basis? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, saying I think of what I experienced on that project is similar to what they're talking about. This is so unusual, uh, you know, that it's, it's a one-off thing. I mean, it, it, so to do all that, there were a whole bunch of people involved. So there were engineers, there was electrical contractors, and this special testing group to analyze it, and it took them two whacks at it to figure it out. And they rolled out the breaker and they sent it off and they said, oh, gee, sorry, we got a bad breaker. <laughs> okay. There's one other part of the, the whole thing that we don't know what's going to happen is um, we're also trying to show DEP that we're progressive and active and trying to figure out what went wrong at the plant. My goal is hopefully by doing this approach also is that uh, we lessen our fines and penalties that might come out of this event also. Mm -hmm. We know we're going to get an enforcement action from them. I just haven't seen it yet. So, um, all in favor of approving this contract? Aye. 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 Uh, contract for the wastewater treatment plant sample analysis to Premier Lab in the amount of $200. Second. Uh, last year, the cost was $8,561. Uh, it was a different vendor. This year's low bid is $9,230. Basically, it's uh, yearly testing of uh, analyticals at the wastewater treatment plant that we can't do at our lab down there. So there's nitrogen, there's BOD, there's uh, effluent toxicity, there's uh, the T-clip or the toxic characteristic leaching procedure for sludges, things like that. So it's an annual contract we have at the wastewater treatment plant. Do we get a uh, motion? Yes, there we go. All in favor of this contract? Aye. 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 Sweet. Uh, set date for Plans Committee meetings. Um, when is our next meeting? 28th. It's not. It would be the 28th. Oh, it's the 28th. Yeah. Second and fourth, Wednesdays of the month. And Thanksgiving is the 22nd? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wasn't your iPhone 5 playing on Thanksgiving? You would think there'd be like a big turkey on it or something, but no. There's a little shoot all of paper thing in the dollar bill. Tell me I have the day off there, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what would you say? A guy with a belt buckle on his hat. Uh huh. <laughs> oh, could be. Could be. <laughs> I don't have that either. So 28 Longview is actually a water abatement request, sewer abatement request, one of the two, and uh, 96 North Street is a sewer claim. So you want to do it on the 28th? Sure. The 20th or the 28th? 28th. 28th. You said Longview was water? It's a, it's a request on the claim we just went through. It's her sister. Oh, right. Who claims that she has excessive water bills too. <laughs> That was, that was hard. Yeah, that was yeah. hard. Yeah. We'll have to keep that moving. Um, all right, so 5 and 5.15? Five, yep. Okay, great. Uh, <clears throat> old business, private ways. Uh, still doing research, uh, making headway in the next list. I've got a tentative list of 10 streets for our next viewing, uh, whenever that's going to be. I wanted to get the letter about snow plowing out, Terry. I haven't seen a response. What's up with that? Yeah, that's okay. So, um, like I said, I'm still doing research on some of the ones, but the next ones are going to have a wide selection of streets, I think, that you'll find that 
some are ones that we want to accept, some are others that you may not want to accept, kind of both ends of the spectrum. Uh, actually, some would survey work that would have to be done, so we test the waters of the cost of that also. So, do you think we could um, set the uh, a date for another viewing? Are we far enough along to... Uh... I believe so. I just need to give plenty of notice to the uh, abutters. We have a letter written as a matter of getting all the mailing lists from uh, OPD and get them into a uh, mailing list format, and then we can send out the, the letters. Yeah, just the question is, do you want to attend? Do you want to do... I mean, the last time we did it was... Uh, Three solid hours. If we do ten, you're looking at probably six hours. Yes, I, I do think we need to have more than one uh, coffee break. <laughs> so, do you want to try to keep it at six like you did ten, last time, a half hour each one? Well, if you have ten, I'm wondering if we should. If we do, I mean, we know in. there's more than ten to go, right? So there's there's total of 52, right, so unless just, the six we did. Oh, we could just do one a week for the next year. Well, or we could do yeah. six. Uh, should you do five and five? Six, 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 six is I thought that was That's really fine. pretty easy to do. Okay. Um, okay. How about eight? A Danish somewhere in the middle would have been awesome. But it was still pretty easy. We actually did grab some German yeah. stuff. Which were good but it didn't count, right. Just thinking about the time component when you get back to the board meeting and then you have to shuffle through them. If you have eight in one board meeting, you might want to think about the time factor to, to get through those once you're, you're done it with the like six was the main number. Yeah. yeah, I would just think that I would hate to do more than six because then it pretty much means you can't do anything else on that day. And depending on the day, we, we might have more agreement if we just keep it to six. Yeah. And particularly as we get into ones where the it's not going to be as cut and dry. I think our due diligence is going to require that we actually spend time with the people. They're going to have they're going to have things to say. That's a good yeah. point. Yeah. So, so I don't want to go shorter than half an hour. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So why don't I do this? Why don't I uh, find six uh -huh. that cover the spectrum, and we'll get that out, and I'll get going on another six that maybe we can tackle towards the end of December or early January. Yeah. All right. What so if we look better? at our calendars, mm -hmm. About December first. I will not be in, in town on December 1st. I'll be in Seattle. Well, I don't want to do this in Seattle. <laughs> because we can hold up our cell phones. Hey, you can do, do it without me, but I, I, I enjoy it. I, I don't yeah. want you to change the oh, date. Oh, we don't want to cut down on your pleasure. So. <laughs> so you want to try the 8th? Oh, 8th's not good for me. I mean, the holidays is a tough time. It's just, it's, <laughs> it's not easy. I think it would be nice to get each one more that's done this yeah. year, though. Yeah. We really be <laughs> well, 15 for so. sure is problematic. So we may not get everyone. I mean, it's, yeah, it's fine. Do we have a mic schedule? I don't. Mm. We want to attend everybody's I can do first. the first, but I can't do the other. Would we object to being here on Sunday? Then we might not get people. Well, it's Saturday. It's a religious day for some people too. It, it's I. I can do either day. I don't know right. what the public would think. I don't know. David, I don't know. Okay, I'm okay. Do you know? Yeah. So you're saying either the first or the second, or the eighth or the ninth? Is that what we're saying? I'm not. I think Sunday's a little, kind of an odd day. Well, that. I think it would be better to stick to Saturdays myself, but yeah. I can do either. I think weather. So let's find out from. I could do either one. I think eighth may be a, a little more of a problem, but uh, let's find out with Mike. I think the eighth would be better for me timing wise. Um, I'm scheduled to be out till the twenty sixth. So to get all this information and eighth it is. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Did we find out if the private weight issue extends beyond snow removal? There are two points of state statute that, and Alan sent me an email in regards to it. There are two different um, statutes where 
cities can go and approach sewers in private ways uh, with assessments, betterment assessments. And by a council order vote, they can go in and do maintenance on private ways. And in the past, apparently, in the city, that had been done as long as the residents paid for the materials and the cost of doing those repairs in those ways. But the DPW undertook them. So this is this actually goes back to the 60s and 50s uh, that I've seen some documents on that. City Council allowed work, maintenance work to be done on paving type activities, filling potholes, things like that in these private ways, as long as the residents paid for the cost. And sewers can be done to a betterment assessment where, you know, basically if we believe, um, perfect one is Pine Valley Road. Uh, the city went in there in the 60s and actually forced uh, the area to be sewered and brought water in also because of, uh, I assume, health concerns. Now, in a situation where the, where the residents are underwriting the entire cost of the work, what's the advantage of having the city do it as opposed to a private contractor? I'm not quite following that. The city underdoing... Well, you said that the, that the city did the work, but the residents paid for costs of costs of whatever the upgrades yeah, were. Yeah, I think it was probably cheaper to be done. The, okay. the city back then had actually full-time pipeline crews. Right. Before Proposition 2.5, my understanding there was... 120, 130 people employed at the DPW with full-time crews laying sewer pipes, water pipes, drain pipes. They currently now also do is really these maintenance projects. Right. So as a practical matter, nowadays it might not be advantageous for the residents to get involved with, with the city on that on a private way. I would think their best interest would probably be to hire a private contract. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Because yeah. if the city does it, we'd have to do it for wage rates and you know, contracts to pay. It, it gets costly when we yeah. do public procurement. So, December 8th, um, stormwater and flood control, they're, they're, um, the city council councilors have um, settled on the 29th of this month, 7 o'clock JFK. It's the day after our next meeting. Um, our hope is to advance the discussion about financing. Broadly speaking, we could, the city, could elect to just leave everything the way it is so the general fund pays for stormwater drains, the general fund comes up with money for the dikes, for the pumping station. Uh, we could talk about the potential for an override, which, which has a lot of drawbacks, so much so that it's almost not a serious option, but um, people feel it needs to be put out there and discussed. The problem with the override is that we don't know from year to year what the exact budget needs to be. So if we, my understanding is if we have an override that uh, funds a budget of X, and next year a project comes up and we need to be X plus uh, Y, we'd have to go back and do another override to get the additional Y to add to the X. Um, it's just hard to imagine running some kind of an enterprise fund that way. Uh, the town of Westfield, my understanding is, charges a somewhat modest fee to everyone, so they have a stormwater fee, but then they also combine that with some general fund money, so they're running kind of a hybrid. And then the last option would be a, a full-on enterprise fund like sewer and water. Um, so <clears throat> the idea is there'd be some discussion of those four alternatives, and then zero in on the enterprise fund or the fee itself and talk about how that could be structured, different ways of doing that. Um, the Chamber of Commerce is interested in getting involved. There are a few people who have come forward like to talk to us if there is a fee about how it should be, could be most fairly structured. So my hope is we come in, we do the, that discussion, take questions, get people thinking about it, and then the next step after that might be some kind of a committee with participation of the business community to uh, come up with a a fee structure that everyone can kind of get behind. Do you have a, any feeling as to how the council members are oriented? Everyone who talks about it at any length quickly kind of 
starts hanging their head, and it's just hard to imagine a way out of this that doesn't involve a fee. Um, everyone's careful to say we're going to have to really talk about this and develop support for it and make sure that the whole community is involved, but it sure looks like a fee is the only way to do it. Well, I, I agree, but I wonder if that perception is getting traction. Oh, I, I, think, I think within the council it is. And that's really who votes. Yeah, I you know we'll see. Everyone's kind of being careful at this stage. Sure. Did the council confirm that the room was reserved for that night and put on the city calendar and all sorts of things? You know, I don't know. I suggested that they should. I'll look into it tomorrow. Okay. Um, that's the date. I just don't know whether the room was reserved and put on oh, the city oh, calendar. Oh, okay. So, but I think Paul. Vector might know. I can call Mary in the door. We'll just we'll just take care of it. Okay. You get another phone? Mm. No? Okay. Mm -hmm. Alright. Well that's the uh, stormwater unless uh, I assume that's gonna be in the same format again, Terry. Yeah. Okay. Bill Dwight being the the moderator basically and you're doing a presentation. Was that all right last time? Any, any yeah, I was trying to get a great job. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, I've, I've always said to uh, to Ned, I, I feel like I can be more opinionated. I, I think it's it's important that he be a trusted, neutral, you know, just the facts man. And I think it's easier for me to uh, give opinions. And I, I think. And you know, Bill's not going to be shy. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I still think that at some point, and I'm not sure how to enter this into the discussion, that we want to con we might want to consider, and maybe the Chamber of Commerce is the way to do this, is how to incentivize, you know, some sort of mediation program, um, particularly businesses um, who who might have the wherewithal to do something substantial. Yeah. Um, I don't know where to enter it into the discussion, but I'm going to keep banging on that drum. I, well, I, I think it is at that point yeah. where we're trying to put together a fee. I mean, I, we've heard from uh, people that own big parking lot sized Yeah, they're going to want to do something. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. There's, there's an engineering piece to all this is that eventually, under the 100 year storm event, the on site stormwater storage overflows. That's what mm -hmm. it does, it's designed to do. And, and then what happens? So, the, the same three foot, two foot, one foot diameter pipes that run across the city are going to uh, be utilized and we have to maintain it. So it, it's almost like you'd, you'd see less water a lot of the time, but you still need that system no. in there. Oh, for the big storm. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, it, it's exactly what I've been thinking. You know, what do you do for somebody? How do you, they, they figured out that 20% of the time, or that, that they never use 20% of their parking lot. It's just there. Right. Doesn't matter when you go, even at Christmas, there's still empty spaces. So they have an incentive to pull up pavement and, and you know, build a, a constructed wetland, whatever, a stormwater management facility, and still going to overflow into our system. So what do you do about that? It's the part that. That's a good point. That's a good point. But I, I, I think that um, there are going to be situations where it does improve your 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 predicament a little bit. Yeah. And and the other part of it is is that I think that it's going to help us sell what is going to be a really hard product to market. If they're if, if all that we're telling them is that it's negative, negative, negative. That that, that, yeah. that even if just the perception is that we're contributing to solving the problem as a community, I think that's going to help us. You know, do you know, launch a pretty pretty tough campaign. I mean, we hear Mary and Lavarge say this every time. That these types of issues come up, that people are hurting, and and uh, you know yet another tax on people who are who are finding themselves in that position. Uh, it's just we got we got to figure out ways to make it a, a, a more popular story to tell. Yeah. How about Hurricane? Uh, Sorry, Pete. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I mean, you know, that's a that's yeah. That's a, how hurricanes can be. Yeah. We missed a big one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've got some, I have some figures on Hurricane Irene up in the Deerfield. We got nothing. It's mm -hmm. significant. Well, we were worried, but we really got nothing.
nothing in, in uh, I mean, but uh, these are three tributaries or you know, in the Deerfield River, which is where the damage was, and uh, North River, these are all in Coleraine, and there's a Green River, and so the peak flows were two and a half times as much as any previous peak flow. It is, so it isn't, you know, the 100-year flood plus 10%. It's two and a half times. Ned, Ned and I were talking, uh, unless you have some other stuff, I don't mean to interrupt. No, no, I'm just saying that the flood potential has not, we have not, we the community have not addressed. Ned and I were talking about, so we have, we have the Connecticut River, and we have our town that's kind of up on a hill. If you had a straight dike, the water would just come up and go around. So we actually have like a smile sort of protecting us from the river. And as we've talked about in the meetings, when rain falls in the city, we have the potential to get a little lake here on the upside of the smile. He uh, did some quick calculations about how much rain fell during Irene up here. And it looked like... No, actually, it was just the storm in August. Is that right? It was... We calculated there was enough rain that fell, I think, back in August when they had to turn the pumps on, that if it wasn't pumped out, you quickly have a lake about 15 acres in size, 10 feet deep. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing how much rain comes down. Who, who did that? Uh, I did back oh, and after uh, uh, thing. Our hydrologist. <laughs> <laughs> Crude engineering. It, but, but that was a, that wasn't a big rain. No, it was big enough that they had to turn on the pumps. Yeah, to get it out of the city. Yeah. yeah. So we did a hot wash down at the uh, hearing room today, which was fire, police, everyone on this Hurricane Sandy, and you know lessons learned what we could do better. And uh, Josh Shanley, the emergency management coordinator, was talking about other communities got hit in the state of Maryland. Eight inches of rain in an hour yeah. out of that event. And eight inches of rain, just phenomenal amounts of rain that came down. And we really lucked out. I mean, yeah. completely missed us, the, except for some winds. The, you know, your, your uh, the city is about to do the um, <coughs> emergency action plan for the dams. We just did ours. And <coughs> what they call, the, I think it's the half PMF, the half probable maximum flood. The elevation comes out to, uh, I think it was almost 150 feet above sea level. And it was all about our dam. Like, what do we do for the people down the river, you know, that are during the probable maximum flood? It's 150 over your dam? It must be. The height of our dam is 143 feet. That's the height of the dam. The spillway is one, 136 with the flash course. So we have seven feet that we could potentially spill before it goes. But this is another seven feet above that. That, that half PMF is, I think, 26 inches of rain over 72 hours? The half is 18. I was actually just looking at oh, it. The full okay. PMF is 36. And that's that's up in Waverly, though. It could be a little bit less here. But, yeah. It's a lot of water. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, you know, and forget about the people that uh, don't forget about it, but I mean, people upstream are also going to be, obviously, if there's seven feet of water over everything. I mean, that's, the athletic fields are 143, you know, the, the, the upper terrace, we call it. <coughs> the softball field is less, and the, and the um, soccer fields are, I think they're down below the spill, they're like 135. I think the floodplain out close to West Street's like 133, but they're saying 150 feet yeah. above sea level. It'd be over by the snow sledding hill. Uh, yes. Uh, it's up against the entire side of the hill, the, the, the um, outdoor, the, the 400 meter track is under six or seven feet of water. And that would go all the way across over to Sage Hall. And I can't imagine it. Yeah, it's right. Seem it's like, like it there seem wouldn't be, you wouldn't even know there's a dam there. You'd see a few ripples in the water and that would be it. That's what I was going to say. It doesn't seem like you can design a spillway to pass that kind of water. <laughs> no, you. First of all, you'd have to have a higher dam, and then this building would have to be eight times longer. You know, I was working in Manhattan over the weekend, and this apartment that I was working in looks down on the West Side Highway, 
the Hudson, New Jersey. Beautiful views. And the super, the people took off for the storm. Um, I know them because they have a house out in the Berkshires, so I was able to, they just went to the Berkshires. Um, but uh, the superintendent told them the water was four feet deep in the street in front of their house. And if you look across from their house, they, they had me look down. The apartment across this little side street has a underground parking. So it filled up to the ceiling and then some. So those cars weren't just in the water. They were totally submerged. There are a quarter of a million cars down there that have been in the salt water. And in one of the parking lots, I was watching them put dollies under the wheels of cars so that they could then, and they had six guys pushing the cars around like those, you know those little games where you move the squares mm -hmm. to get the numbers in? They were moving cars around like that, just or reorganizing them, getting ones out to the front that the insurance adjusters were going to come and see. And all of the they cars, all of the cars looked like someone was taking a shower. There was beads of water on all the windows wow. of the car. Wow. Uh, they're all just... Did you say a half a million cars? A quarter of a million. Quarter. We're in the salt water. Between Long Island, oh, Manhattan, oh, oh, the Staten Island. Just that that parking garage, yeah. yeah. I, I, uh, I went there, too. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, up at the part where Sandy came ashore. If you're into used cars, be careful. Yeah. All right, so stormwater? We're good. Solid waste planning update. We don't have the full committee. I we have a, where's we have Mike? A meeting okay. Who's going to do this? I thought you had a meeting on the second. You did have a meeting that I went to uh, accidentally, but Stacey's right. meeting was kind of interesting. I think it was on the second. It was. I think we could table this item if you're not ready for a full report. It was on the second. No, we, yes, it was on the second. Anything we said would be very interim. Okay. So, so shall we table this for now? You know, things are coming into focus. And, okay. and you have the information you need? There's nothing the staff is... Um, we're, we're getting some more information at the next meeting, right? They're hopeful that uh, staff will be... Uh, All right. ...cracking through several cost estimates. Right. All right. That's the core of it. Okay, Gary. I, I just have a curiosity question. What do you think... Uh, Passing of Buddy Dusso would have to do with the uh, operation of the recycling center out on Lake Chan? Nothing. Nothing. I think it's going to be business as usual. I think it came up at the meeting. There was some question about the um, how marginal their finances were or something like that. I think. That's what I heard. At the meeting on the second. Mm -hmm. Time will tell. Okay, the West Whatley Dam, Phase 2 Engineering Evaluation and Alternatives Analysis. Since we had a short agenda, we decided to make it long. I decided to put this, I decided to put this on there. Um, I just wanted to bring, a, bring it to the board's attention that um, we're working with, with GZA, our dam uh, consulting engineer, on these Phase 2 studies that are looking at all the deficiencies for the dams that we're responsible for. So. A few months ago, um, we had talked about the results of uh, the phase two study for the Mountain Street uh, Reservoir and that dam. Uh, and I think the estimate for that, uh, for the deficiency, to, to repair the deficiencies of that dam were about $4 million. This report, which we just got, um, Ned and I got, uh, I don't know, a couple weeks ago or something, we've been working with some comments and, and getting the final document into, into shape, <coughs> identified um, a number of deficiencies of the West Whateley Dam, which is the the smaller of the two dams up in Whateley, for those of you that have been up that's, in the That's the, the drawing right behind you, I think. It is the drawing right behind me. The one behind the church. That's yeah. right, the one right behind the church. So um, they had, uh, GZA had, had identified a number of um, deficiencies on this particular dam related to insufficient spillway capacity, which Gary was just talking about, um, inadequate factors of safety, um, against slope failure, um, under certain conditions, um, seepage, seepage analysis and, and other um, slope stability problems. And then a problem with um, seepage under the dam, so a lot of water sort of going through and, and under the dam and coming up on the other side, which is something that makes geotechnical engineers very nervous about uh, 
water going under it. Boils. Right. Um, so they've come up with a, a series of recommendations that involve construction of an emergency spillway. Um, they were on a very small plan in the board package. Did anybody see that? I did see that plan. Electronically, I could zoom in and see how absolutely out of focus it was. <laughs> <laughs> so that could be, uh, be a real treat if I had this full-size plan up here for tonight. Um, but they've got a, just sort of a schematic um, of what the, the recommended improvements are. So uh, the church is right here. The spillway and the bridge on Williamsburg Road is sort of on this side and the reservoir itself is up here. So there are several components related to flattening of the downstream slope on the dam, um, construction of a long parapet wall, wall um, to mitigate against uh, wave uh, action and the overtopping of the dam. And then this sort of diagonally hatched area would be um, the construction of an emergency spillway, which would allow the dam to pass um, what the half PMF is the design storm from this, this particular dam. So that would be 18 inches of rainfall um, in this area. So um, the cost estimate that they've put together at this point for this work is $2.2 million. Um, so you can see that these dam projects are coming into the, the tune of several million dollars. Um, and as the, these reports should all be done by the end of this calendar year. And Ned and I are going to be working with GZA and, and the board as well to prioritize the work that needs to be done. Um, even within certain projects within one dam, I think we need to look at, you know, what are the risks of delaying repair? Can we phase these things over 10 years or 20 years? Um, at this point, the Office of Dam Safety is really uh, holding dam owners that have um, high hazard dams that are in poor condition, like Upper Roberts, those are the ones that are getting deadlines and orders from the state that you need to take care of these immediately and uh, either bring them up to uh, current standard or to, or to take them down. There's some talk about the Office of Dam Safety going into other categories of dams, uh, but they haven't really done that in terms of dictating schedule for improvements. These dams, uh, West Whaley was built, you know, around 1900, Mountain Street, about the same time. The Ryan Dam, um, which we're working on the Phase Two right now, um, you know, was built in 1970 or so, but still has deficiencies. Um, but I think the important thing is that we really need to get a handle on the, the recommendation, all the recommendations for all the dams, and then looking at them from a risk-based standpoint and then an affordability standpoint. To, to tackle some improvements over a period of time in a way that makes sense both from a ratepayer perspective and also from a from a dam safety perspective. So there's a lot going on and I just felt like it was a good time since we just received another one of these final reports to get the funding and let you know that that's the direction we're headed in. Thanks. Gary. Are the <clears throat> water supply dams, are those all in fair condition or are they in better condition than that? Um, that's a good question. This, I think they're all in fair condition. Um, I think they're all in fair condition. And is there any update on the FEMA MEMA money? No, there's not. In fact, uh, our engineer is GZA out of uh, Springfield now. Um, just had to get some additional submittals to FEMA for additional information. They were concerned about uh, mitigating expenses for if it did fail, what are the estimates of uh, release to the environment over a 10-day period or a 20-day period? So this is Upper Roberts? Uh, actually, this is pertaining to the... Uh, the wall? The, road, the wall project and the um, Zany Beach erosion issue going on. We haven't heard anything more or any new requests about Upper Roberts Meadow at, uh, Reservoir at this point. So that's still under review. I have been told that FEMA is no longer considering dam dismantles as part of mitigation projects now, though. But ours is in the mix. So I thought that was interesting that ours made it in the mix, and now they're not considering others going forward. Um, any other? I, I was just wondering, relative to the Upper Roberts, if, if uh, there's ever been any uh, consideration or communication with conservation people about 
donating the the whole, the territory, the land that we own there, and the and the waterway to a conservation operation that might have a better shot at raising stream restoration money. Well, I think would be I think the city would be as capable of raising stream restoration money as any other uh, nonprofit right. organization would be. The concern is, is that it's still part of the watershed that feeds the middle reservoir, which is an emergency backup water supply still. Even though it's not currently used, it's designated as that. Plus, to turn over the land to another agency or to gift it or to surplus it, it would take an act of legislature to do it. Kind of, it's like parkland, Article 97 land. This is land dedicated for watershed purposes. And so that will have to be released signed by the governor. Well, it still could be designated for watershed purposes, mm -hmm. even though we didn't have to pay the bill. I don't, well, I don't remember, I, I, I can't quite align all of those discussions with when you started on the board, but, I mean, we did explore, at least on a discussion level, that we just give the land the abutters of the dam. Could we, is there some way we could, you know, just let go of it? Even we'll give them a quarter of a million dollars and the dam. And, you know, ultimately no one else has the resources to fix the, no one else has the kind of resources right. the city has. Right. Um, and it, it really is something that needs to be taken care of. And yeah. The board, at least at that time, felt like, no, it's a, if it's the right thing to do, we have to do it. Thanks. So as you know, in the assumption pages of our budgets, we had you have either six or seven million dollars built into the budgets for, I believe it was FY15, FY16, starting to do this dam work. So that's in our five-year projection costs already, so it's it's not something new that's going to hit the budget, but we are preparing for it if it does come up. Okay. And I didn't know that Amoresco owned a cell tower. Apparently they do. either. <laughs> <laughs> That is my mistake to DJ. American cell tower. Oh, you said Amaris. I did. It's been a hectic day. Um, <laughs> they called me again today, want to know if we want to sell the lease. I said, we'll send over some information. As of uh, quarter of five, I hadn't seen anything. So I thought I'd have an update for you as to their recent offer that they're willing to start negotiating at. The issue they can't seem to get is the fact that we have a lease until 2020, and the only way we could break that lease is if we put it out to bid and someone else is the new bidder, and then if someone wins the bid, they still have to pay us that lease for the next eight years, and they have no tower after that. So... I don't think they're getting the whole public procurement picture, but they're trying to get an extension of the contract. That's their bottom line. They want to either own the site outright or get another 10-year term. We still have eight years left in the contract. Gary, anything else? Updates on the pond? The lumpy, bumpy crossing? <laughs> Gene Casey did ask about the lumpy bumpy crossing and told him to come to my stairs and I don't, I don't know what's going on with that. I, I certainly don't have access to my that for sure. I don't have time for that. The pond is going quite well. That pond, actually. The one that the people call the dredging project. <laughs> <laughs> the dredging project. But we do need to dredge it. I didn't follow that. The newspaper article in the Gazette last night, which was on the front page of Section B, had a big photograph yeah, of Paradise yes. Pond. It said Paradise Pond Dredging right. Project. It's not a dredging project. There's no dredging going on. It's all dam repair. And they sort of said that in the body of the article. It actually was a very brief little thing. But we are dredging Lyman Pond. I was going to say, what's going on with the Greenhouse Pond? That, that is a dredging project. And they made it sound like it was also possibly a dam repair. There was really some similarity. <laughs> there's, there's no dam. It's just a hole in the ground. It's a pipe that lets the little bit of water that flows in there out. 
And can we support non-invasive aquatic species? Because will they winter over here? Non-invasive aquatic species. Well, I thought that was in the article. You're going to get rid of some invasive species in the uh, the pond. The little pond has got some uh, kind of iris. It's an invasive iris there. Uh, not not. Uh, it's not animal life it's plant life yeah yeah that's all going away too that's part of it and we're also introducing a uh, 10, 10 gbm flow which currently goes directly into paradise pond but i believe it's splitting drains from Nissen library and right hall and we're going to divert that water over into the little pond which overflows into the same pipe that then goes into paradise pond ship it over here just for a few minutes and it'll go right back into the pond Chris, anything? No, other than I had a chance to talk to a couple of the guys who were doing the work on the uh, on the barn um, last Saturday morning, and they were happily blasting holes in the concrete with their with their with their. So I don't they, know why you do it. Why wouldn't you just fill a truck with sand and just drive it right down the middle, kind of fast, so everything sort of fell in. <laughs> so it goes down like this as it's breaking away, <laughs> yeah, exactly. like Indiana Jones. They movie. do that in the cartoons all the time. <laughs> So that was kind of neat. Yeah. Um, let's see. One thing that's come up is that we started notifying Bay State Gas of some uh, poor cuts that they made in the roadways. Uh, Dave Valletta, our senior engineer, did that. We identified, I think, four road cuts to them today that were basically unacceptable and need to be upgraded, fixed, repaired. I think he started looking back, uh, trying to go back three years, if I remember right trying to put together a program to start looking at those older trench cuts. Yeah, we have the engineering staff working on a testing protocol, I mean an inspection protocol. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to, look at, to go back three years, as Ned said, and then also to look at, to try to look at the new ones as they're done, so if they're put in from day one bad, that they get fixed right away and then look at them after two years. So um, we're trying to come up with a way to systematically revisit all these trench permits that are issued. But they're, they're warranted for five years, aren't they? They are. They are. So, an example is one down by the high school, 38 North Elm Street. The ones in front of the post office, they were notified of that you need to go out and fix those, please. And and wouldn't you think in front of the post office that they should just cut a whole trough there instead of the little... It's... What, what they did, I mean, in case some of you haven't noticed it... They're chasing leaks is what they're yeah. doing, Terry. <laughs> but, but what they've done is... This, they've got four by four foot squares and then 18 inches of old pavement, a four by four, 18 inches, four by four, 18 inches. So in order to drive over 30 feet of roadway, there's bump, 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 bump. They struck me as interim repairs or interim Well, it, I thought at first maybe that was the case, but it sure looks like nothing else is happening. It's, it's hopscotch for cars. Yeah. <laughs> You'd rather just a bump, bump. I think that it should be all one piece. What no do you bump. think? I mean, doesn't... What? Oh, right. Bump and bump. Yeah, yeah. I get it. Bump on, bump off. Yeah. yeah. So, so we have started the conversations. I can further that conversation with our new uh, office manager who I met uh, about two weeks ago. And they're excited to hear from you. They always are. Oh, look, it's Ned. <laughs> 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 All right, well, that's great. I, and it, it seems to me that as you work on the protocol, the protocol might, we, we may have to circle back to the trench permit mm -hmm. fee. You know, then if we have, we have these additional costs of running our program that's under the trench permit, we might have to incorporate that into the fee program, too. Then we have to do it, though. Exactly. Not that the West Waverly Dam wasn't exciting enough, but <laughs> I can't really top that. Tomorrow, <laughs> yeah, tomorrow. Oh, what about tomorrow? Smith College. There'll be a screening of the liquid assets documentary about water infrastructure across the country. So hopefully uh, we'll see everybody there. What time is that? Some of you. The film starts. There's uh, introductions at 6:45. The film rolls at 7. It's a 90-minute documentary. There'll be a panel discussion for a half an hour afterwards, and then there'll be a little reception, social thing, so. Right, right Hall. Right. At right Hall, that's right. And our very own Terry Coyne will be one of the honorable members of the panel uh, that we have there. 
We're going to have um, Todd Brown from Tie and Bond will be one of the other panelists, and Captain Skeever from TEP will be the will be the last panelist. So should be fun. So hopefully, if you can make it, that'll be good. If we don't get to make it tomorrow night, is there another opportunity to see the film? Uh, I own the DVD, so oh, uh, you know, oh, you're in sure. luck. Oh, yeah. Um, I'd love to do that. So, but you could buy the DVD. You don't oh. get the panel discussion yeah. with the DVD. Oh, yeah. You only get the panel discussion and the free coffee afterwards. Free coffee? So you can do private showings here at the DPW. Yeah. Oh, but we'll have but to post them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> None of these free things. Um, something else too, Chad Kane um, has been doing a pretty good job following public yeah. works items. I've been good quite stuff. proud of the Gazette yeah. and their interest in, in all things DPW, which has been good. But uh, yeah. Chad ran a couple little pieces in the paper. He's keeping track of the Barnes Flora pair, which we we're quite happy to see. Our staff have been working um, you know, hard on Saturdays trying to get the, the Barnes Flora repair fixed, and we're making progress on that, so we're happy about it. Um, and Ned and I have been working on this It's Your Infrastructure addition to the website blog, which is sort of a two, one or two photo a week um, snapshot of things that are happening to public works that we're putting up on the blog just to um, let people know the things that we're doing because there's a lot um, that's going on um, that you know, people might be interested in, so I'm trying to get, trying to get the word out. That's all that. I'll just report out that the Saturday the community uh, tag sale went really well for the great event. Very active all morning long. Good set of volunteers. And that was in Florence? Yes, Smith Grove. Smith Grove. Across the street. Mm -hmm. Any chance that they'll have some, that they let them use a room? Or, uh, I mean, is there any, the school department I know, and I'm sure they're protective of. Well, we have the toy exchange coming up in December. And we use the cafeteria at Smith Park there. Mm -hmm. So they've been a good partner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. David? Bill? Yeah. Well, you already mentioned it, but I really like the DPW's been getting a lot of positive. And I think it's, it's a positive thing. I mean, I, I started to be involved with the DPW when there was a lot of negativity. So I'm really pleased to see all this positive stuff, and really just basic good PR. So I just think that that's great, and I think it's well-deserved, too. Um, and I, I love the green lines on South Street. <laughs> I like them, too. I wrote on that, by the way. I thought it was kind of neat. I didn't quite understand it, but it looked really good, I thought. It looked great. Yeah, yeah I don't know. I hope they last a long time. But there was a lot of community input into that design yeah. also. Is green a lot the of standard? Um, it is in some cities. Mm -hmm. We decided to try it there. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, there was a great input. Uh, Councilor Schwartz ran those community meetings with DPW staff, and mm -hmm. that was kind of the consensus of the neighborhood what to do out there. Mm -hmm. What's this? Uh, I'm missing. Get on your bike and ride, young man. South Street <laughs> one those, It's one of those wide streets. <laughs> yeah. So now if you, as you drive up from East Tampa toward the city, there's parking along the right. Then there's a bike lane. Intermittent parking. In, yeah, intermittent. There's a bike lane, yeah. and then they, they, they chew it up. They put the rumble strip to keep the cars out of that area. So it pushes all the cars over toward the west side of the street and turns into a much narrower street. You do have to drive a little more slowly. Is it an 11 foot lane? It is. It's traffic. So, so, so it's it friction. Looked, it looked like friction it, lanes. I've ridden it on my bike, and then I also drove on it. Yeah, right. Yeah. How, I mean, what do you think, David? I mean, this I is think the cars are going just as fast. <laughs> <laughs> Well, just because we've had two accidents in the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, two, two people. On uh, Yeah, yeah. One guy got his head bashed in, and the other one. Oh, he actually died. died. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. That's too bad. He popped out, though. I mean, he got a... Yeah, oh, no. I'm, yeah. I, they're mitigating circumstances, but no one was even charged on that one. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the, uh, the pavement cuts. I, I was going to ask. <laughs> and um, I have this letter from, I've got some customers in this thing, so I kind of know exactly where it is. 
basically it's the three or four houses that have a, is it even a private way, this thing off of Round Hill and Crescent Street? Sure, those condominiums are, the th three brick buildings I think it is in a row. But also some of the houses on Crescent Street, that's their driveway, their, yeah. their garages face that way. Yeah, there, there's actually two letters, one is uh, about the uh, water issues, the other one is about this private way, which I actually researched it back to about the 1870s. And it's actually a 15 foot wide way that was created that went along all the backsides of all those houses off of uh, Crescent Street. So basically, there's a part of Crescent Street that's coming like this. Round Hill Road is here. And then the houses on Crescent Street, and Clark School sort of over here. There's this little driveway between, the, and they have, their garages face this thing. And they're asking us to make it a public way. <laughs> Is it even a private way? It's all privately owned. Um, it's 15 feet wide. As far as I can tell, like I said, it was created back in the 1870s or so for access to the backsides of all those houses that were being split off of lots. But are we carrying it on our, I don't think it's one of our designated. This is not one of our designated private ways. That's because it's a driveway. It is. And actually, the other, other side of that is the access to the parking lot for the condominiums on Round Hill Road. So it's a shared driveway, and the gentleman who wrote the letter is sick and tired of plowing the driveway for the private homes. He wants the city to do it. But I He has to go past their, their backyards to get to the condominiums. <laughs> so that's on the side of the hill. So even though their front door is on uh, Crescent. Crescent Street, it's really uphill to their front door, right? Is that is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Those houses aren't as close to Crescent as it looks. As they're all kind of up on a hill. Right. They're some of the nicer houses. They are really large houses, yeah. aren't they? Really, some of them are really large. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, so I don't know. So I've got these letters. Um, well, for the private way, when uh, you know to become public way, we can write them back and say you need to file a petition and see what the city council wants to do with it. Because that's the that's the process. Well, they, they have one, two, three, four. They have met the requirements. There's six signatures. Mm -hmm. so, so at some point, we have to move them into the process. If the city council decides to refer, refer it down, the city council can just look at it and say no. Oh. They don't have to agree right, to every right, petition. Right, right. Since it's not on our list and we're not going to be dealing with it, they can go straight to the city council, is what you're saying? Well, no, they, they have to go to the city council. Anyways, that's where the petition well, process I mean, starts. They, can skip, they don't have to come here first because no. we're not dealing that's with right. that. Because petition. the city council is going to say no or they're going to refer it to us for recommendation. Yeah. Yeah, in the planning department. Right. So, um, are we ready to vote for our recommendation? So, I'll I'll tell you what. Why don't I call? They CC Paul Spector. Why don't I call Paul and suggest that they need to direct that to the city council, mm -hmm. and he can circle back to them. I mean, otherwise, you'd have to write the letter. And do you think it would be all right to just call Paul and Anthony? That's fine. That's fine. If you look at the parcel IDs out there, it actually shows this 15-foot wide strip driveway being no man's land. They actually don't... It looks like a city street, like our private ways do. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how it got into the parcel layer that way, but it, it is. But we don't have one on the list. We it do not have this on our list. This street had a name on it, on the drawing. Did you read it? Terry Pauline Drive? No. <laughs> Unknown. Terry Unknown. 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 That's what it says. I read the street after you could take it. <laughs> hmm. I'll, I'll call Paul and have him redirect, have, have him tell them to redirect their letter to the city council. I have a, kind of a related question. These uh, subdivisions over time that have covenants, uh, responsibility by either the owners or the developers to maintain or, or repair improvements. In Baker Hill we encountered one and out in, in the uh, Ryan Road area 
some of the water problems are supposedly related to covenants that are not being followed to, to maintain drainage. How much reliance do these covenants uh, really provide a basis for? I mean, what are, do they become our problems as they get worse and worse, or do, do we just ignore them? Or? I try not to let them become our problem. The problem that we're having is that <clears throat> most of these subdivisions were built, they're supposed to have homeowners associations also. <clears throat> most of them have disbanded over the years. The only active ones I know is, I think it's called Stone, Stone Ridge off of uh, Sandy Hill area, and Ice Pond are the only two active ones that I'm aware of that sends us annual reports, things of that nature. But Great. almost every one of these subdivisions, or the newer ones, have stormwater management areas that are responsibilities of the homeowners association. We have to do an annual stormwater report. Just they're, they're supposed to be doing annual reporting and there's been no follow through from the planning department and now that we're starting to get involved in stormwater, Doug's identified a number of these that are out there and you know, there's, there's no homeowners association attached to them now. Hmm. Should we be proactively letting people know that they're in arrears on their on these reports and that as time permits. I mean we have Doug doing all the stormwater stuff. Well, it would be a, a yeah. letter. I mean just you know sending out a letter but do explaining we have it. Current people to send it to. Well the property owners on the streets. I mean you no know, just to clear up any ambiguity, just to let everyone know that where the dividing line is between their stuff and our stuff. Yeah, we can do that. Does that make sense? I mean, I, I think I know what you're saying. So that uh, ten years from now, when somebody who you know that property's been sold three times, and we send them a letter and say, "Oh, and by the way, this is this is not the city stuff; it's your stuff." Sort of like the same way that people react to. I didn't know it was my street was a private way. way. Oh, I didn't know that that was a stormwater management thing. Right. I didn't know I was supposed to do something. Well, I mean, this this is also a legal issue that the attorneys that are doing closing should reflect in their deed research, and some of them aren't. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's the other part of it. There is uh, obviously it's a it's a if it's in a deed, it's it's deed a deed recorded deed. document. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying it's, it's a legal document. So. But we spent a. We spent some time at the first stormwater public meeting talking about the land behind some houses that was wet. Right. And it's not our land. It's their land. Right, right. Well, yeah. well yeah. that was what? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, and people, the people's expectation is that this is the city ought to be doing something about right. the problem in our backyard. Mm -hmm. I, so that's, that's all. I'm just... Do you think we should be sending a letter to these people that Doug has identified, where he, Doug has identified that there's a neighborhood association that is, seems to have ceased? But I don't think there was, I don't think in the line where neighborhood that we were talking about that there was a neighborhood association. There wasn't, but there's covenants on their deeds. <clears throat> but there should be. There should be, right. As a practical matter, the, 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 the uh, developments that have a stormwater permit would be easy to identify. Right. Would anything beyond how many years have we had this city has a year? Seven years, eight years. So anything beyond seven or eight years would probably take more research to figure out exactly, you know, was this supposed to be a homeowners association? What were they responsible for? I don't really know. But the okay. ones the, the, the ones in you know in, in the last few years would be pretty easy to identify. But you know, it raises an important question too, because a lot of times you're taking an infrastructure problem and you're making a homeowners association responsible for it. And they don't know what to do. They don't know who to hire. Um, and they're, they're not really clear um, what they should do. And you try to set up everything and make sure that if, you know, if there's a homeowners association, they have an operation and maintenance manual and they understand what needs to be done. But yet, a lot of times, um, things aren't done easily. And there have been other communities that have uh, these types of homeowner systems when they, when they do a stormwater utility or something <coughs> like that. They'll the community will take all of these detention basins and other stormwater features and, and take over the maintenance of them because with so many different people responsible for so many different types of infrastructure, it just doesn't get done well. I'm not suggesting that's what the scheme would have to do, but it's well, come up. The, the problem is it comes up in many, many locations. Yeah. Well, I was on the planning board in the late 80s. I mean, I remember us 
having homeowners associations created. Lady Slipper Lane has a homeowners association that was created to, to maintain the retainage permits there. It's a pretty natural system, but there was a homeowners association that was created at some point. And the same thing with the Dickinson subdivision up in, up in Lee. Mm. Well, maybe this so maybe would be a place for this in the whole conversation around around stormwater. It sounds like it. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, yeah. as so often is the case, Jim. As I listen to you, I'm, I'm going inward and I'm going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I maybe we should make sure that that's some at some point in the discussion we talk about whether it makes sense for the city to take over all of these kind of have. These questions do come up. I mean, you know, Doug gets calls all the time. Like, how come the city hasn't been out here taking care of this basin? And what are you going to do? You know, we're concerned. What needs to be done? And Doug's we like, well, you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And that's always the first response is look at what your responsibilities are and figure it out. He works hard. He spends a fair amount of time trying to educate people what their responsibilities are. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important factor to go in the, the public discussion on the clean run. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's when all these subdivisions were created, mm -hmm. you know, over the last 40, 50 years, that there's been stormwater management systems that were approved with some restrictions on them, some conditions, and who's responsible for that? Maybe this is part of the impetus about the credit for the homeowners association and the people who live in these neighborhoods to maintain these stormwater areas properly and they get a part of this credit that we've been talking about. Right, or, or uh, doing the um, mitigation, or if they decide to do mitigation. I like that. Yeah. yeah. So it's good, to, we should just make sure But it is, I mean, I recognize also it's a burden, I mean a staff burden to some extent, but if we can turn it, if we can name it at least, yeah. that's the beginning. Yeah. And incentivize good behavior. Nurture. I make a motion for you, John. Second. Second. Thank you.